Have you ever wondered if the hands that will deliver your child are also hands that have aborted a, a child? Have you ever asked yourself, like I have, why so many OBGYNs now seem to be pro-abortion when they've literally seen life in the womb and have delivered children? Hey everyone, it's Kristen Hawkins. Thanks for joining me today on Explicitly Pro-Life. Today I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Christina Francis. She is the CEO of APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs. Dr. Francis is a board-certified OBGYN who currently works in Fort Wayne, Indiana as an OBGYN hospitalist. She, in addition to being CEO of APLOG, is an associate scholar with the Charlotte Lozier Institute, a board member of Indiana Right to Life, a physician member of the abortion pill reversal network. As a pro-life speaker, Dr. Francis offers her medical expertise, knowledge of bioethics, pro-life reasoning, both here in the United States and around the globe. She has a passion for human rights. Uh, for three years, she actually was the only OBGYN at a mission hospital in rural Kenya uh, and returned to the United States in 2014 to work on behalf of women and children here and abroad who are often victims of the abortion industry. And I've invited her on today because I have a lot of questions about the state of OBGYN care in America and how pro-life doctors handle pregnancy complications that come up. So welcome, Dr. Francis. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Kristen. It's great to be here. Yeah, we usually see each other at events and it's usually in passing in the hallway. I'm speaking, you're speaking, and it's a high buy situation. Um, but I'm so glad to kind of have you on to really dive deep into some of the questions uh, and, and really concerns that pro-lifers across the country are having right now when it comes to OBGYN care in, in America. Um, so sorry, I'm going to be blunt. I have lots of questions for you. but. Um, the first one is, what the hell happened? Like, when did OBGYNs, obstetricians, people who deliver babies, when did they become about killing babies? Well, you know, that's a really great question because I think if you look at, uh, you know, social media, mainstream media, things like that right now, you'll get the impression that most OBGYNs are for abortion. And while I don't know the exact percentage of who would consider themselves to be pro-life and who would consider themselves to be pro-abortion, if you look at their practice, actually what you see is that the vast majority of OBGYNs don't perform abortions. And I think, you know, we, we speak what we think with our hands as physicians. And so, um, and so I think to me that shows, and there, you know, there's probably various reasons why some people don't perform abortions, but I do think that there's a big part of why most of us went into this specialty is because we love obstetrics. We love taking care of pregnant women. We love delivering their babies. And there is just this, I think, cognitive dissonance that has to happen if you go from one room where you're celebrating this, this developing, this life that's developing inside of a woman and you know, you're celebrating that the pregnancy is going well, and then you go into the very next room and you intentionally destroy that preborn life. You know, I mean, there just is really like I said, some cognitive dissonance that has to happen there. And it's interesting if you look back at the history of our profession and our professional societies, the American College of OBGYNs came into existence in the 50s, and they were actually initially pretty pro-life. I mean, they said that uh, induced abortion does not have a role in the field of obstetrics. They only allowed for what they called at the time therapeutic abortions, which would be situations that we would say where you need to intervene in order to save the life of the mother. Um, which I know we're going to talk about today. But then unfortunately, through the 60s and then into the early 70s, they actually played a key role in getting um, the Roe v. Wade decision uh, decided in the way that it was getting abortion legalized in this country. And they just became very pro-abortion, not because that's what their members, the physicians wanted, but because their few pro-abortion leaders, that's what they wanted for the direction of the organization. And then that's actually where our organization came from, was we started as a pro-life special interest group within ACOG. Hmm. How many, you know, uh, we talk about Apolog a lot in our work at Students Life and often cite um, your all's website and trying to, for people like me who are trying to find OB or GYN care, um, how many wow. members does Apolog have? We are uh, over 7,000 members now and wow. growing every day. Yeah, we've added over 400 new members 
just since the beginning of this year. So um, I think a lot of people, a lot of medical professionals who take care of women, especially pregnant women, are really getting disillusioned with their with their previous medical organizations, who, many of whom are following the direction of ACOG and just becoming very, very pro-abortion uh, without any evidence to back that up. That's crazy. Um, you know, often you, you kind of pointed to the, the vast majority of OBGYNs are not committing abortions. Um, but we what we've been seeing recently in the news, all of this, you know, information. I, saw, I think I just saw a news article out of Alabama where it was like a woman now has to be it's like 70 miles is the nearest OBGYN for many women. And it was the mm -hmm. Alabama or Mississippi, one of one of the two. Um, and so we've been so there's been a lot of talk about this coming OB shortage. Um, have you started to see that? That just other like what's happening? Are there like OBs really moving out of red states and just moving to blue states? No, you know um, that is a, a lie that's being perpetuated uh, by the pro-abortion side to fear monger. Shocking, right? I know no one listening to <laughs> will will be shocked by that, but. Um, We've actually seen this this shortage of OBGYNs coming for a long time. I mean, at least okay. a decade that we've had decreasing numbers. And honestly, I think one of the contributing factors to that is that over the last um, probably five to seven years, especially, we have seen an increasing pressure on medical students and on OB residents to participate or refer for abortions. And so a lot of um, pro-life medical students are just avoiding the field of OBGYN altogether because they're afraid, and rightfully mm. so in some circumstances, they're afraid that they will not be able to complete their OB residency without either participating in an abortion and violating their conscience and their, and their morals and what they know mm. to be good for their patients, or having their lives made so difficult because they choose to sort of go against what's considered the mainstream now in OB residencies, even though, again, that's not reflective of how people practice in reality. Mm. But this is what's being done in residency programs. And so we know that a lot of students have self-selected out of the field of OBGYN because of the fear that they will have to participate in abortions. And so um, so we've seen this and I've, I see it in my own state of Indiana. In fact, the zip code next to mine it has not a single prenatal clinic until just the last few months. And so we see these maternity care deserts, even in my home state of Indiana and across the country, where women can't access the care that they really need, you know, good prenatal care. Mm -hmm. They don't need abortions. They need good care during their pregnancy in order to have successful and healthy pregnancies. Um, and we see this dearth of, of OB care because we've had fewer people going into the field and again, I want to make it very clear, this was well before the Dobbs decision. Well yeah, before you're the right. Dobbs you're right. I mean, I've heard this for as long as we've had students for life mm -hmm. and 17 years of students for life. I've had, you know, pre-med students, med students come up to me, say, I wanted to go into OB care. I can't because I'm, I feel like I'm going to be forced to violate my conscience. I've worked so hard to get to this spot. I don't want to get kicked out of medical school. I mean, what's, what's your advice for pre-med students or med students who are just now starting to think about this of, of what they can do so they can you know go into OBGYN care which we deep you know desperately need but also know they're not going to be forced to commit abortions yeah absolutely well the first thing i would say is please go into OBGYN <laughs> we need more pro life right. obs and you are not alone i know it feels so lonely for so many students um, but that's one of the greatest reasons that we exist is to help support the next generation of pro-life um, physicians, pro-life midwives. And, um, and so one, the first thing I would say is you are not alone. The next thing I would say is that there are probably some programs that you want to avoid because it will be difficult for you there. Um, but uh -huh. the good news is there are programs out there that may not be, you know, outwardly pro-life but they are definitely gonna be accommodating of um, conscience protections uh, and things like that and not force you into uh, performing abortions or uh, you know, even observing abortions. You know, For me as a medical student, I wasn't even willing to go in and observe an abortion because that felt mm -hmm. like I would be you know, complicit in that action. So, yeah. um, so there are definitely programs out there. And then also to know 
that AppLog is out there fighting for you. We are fighting for your rights. We are pushing back actively against requirements by groups like the ACGME, which is the accrediting body for medical education programs that requires abortion training to be opt out now, as opposed to opt in like it was when I was a student. So now, and that's a difference of one word, right? That's a big change. So now if you don't want to commit an abortion in your medical training, you have to opt out because they're automatically opting everyone in. Exactly. Exactly. So it's a big deal. And so it sets up a coercive environment, as I'm sure many students who are listening can imagine. You know, here you are, the lowly intern. You are seriously the lowest man on the totem pole. And you have to go to all of these people who are going to determine the course of your career. They're going to determine whether you can finish your residency. And you have to say, I know that that's standard training, but I don't want to do it. I mean, that's a very, sure, there are students who are bold enough to go and say that, but it sets up a very coercive environment, especially for students who maybe don't have that boldness or that courage to be able to say that, but they feel very uncomfortable with the thought of participating in an abortion. And then that just sets up this coercive environment. And then what we find is that then, unfortunately, they're convinced that this is what's good for their patients. And they're convinced that this is a normal part of OB practice when it really isn't. Wow. I mean, I'm so, that's why I'm so thankful for what you're doing. You know, our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, others who are standing up for conscience protections of students. And I mean, that's one of the things that we we try to reiterate over and over again. Every time I talk to a med student is you have conscience rights. We've got your back you know, email us as as soon as something comes up and we will get you to uh, the right help, whether it's a it's a doctor in practice, whether it's a lawyer, um, you don't fear this because it, it is true. We need more OBGYNs who are fiercely uh, and boldly uh, against the violence of abortion. Um, let's, I want to go into what you all are doing at Applog, and I mean, I guess, how are you talking to pro-life docs right now about how to handle some of these pregnancy complications that arise that are life-threatening for mothers? Do you all have uh, recommended courses of treatment? Um, Because I know that's something that comes up all the time. Like anytime I'm having a conversation with someone, whether it's on campus or a stay house with a legislator, um, you know, the pregnancy complications come up. Well, what about in this circumstance? And, you know, our line at Students for Life has been, you know, abortion is never, you know, a direct abortion is never medically necessary. Um, and the left just goes crazy uh, with that line. Um, and they're like, you're a liar that's not true. What about ectopic pregnancy? And then we're like, okay, but that's not, you know, how do you answer these questions? Yeah. Well, this is, you know, this really, I think has been the biggest um, area of misinformation that's been used to Mm -hmm. scare people into supporting really radical abortion policies. Um, You know, I think this is what we're seeing in states like Ohio, you know, that, that um, where they're gaining support for this really radical amendment is because people are afraid that women are going to die. And this nothing could be further from the truth. So first of all, what we're doing as an organization is um, issuing guidance. And you know, it's interesting, a, like I said, ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, they claim to be the premier sort of guidance setting organization for the practice of obstetrics. And yet they have yet to issue any guidance whatsoever to physicians in states who have practiced, uh, who have passed pro-life protections to say, here's what you can do to take care of your patients. Instead, all they've said is these pro-life protections are awful. They're going to lead to women dying and they're just continuing the misinformation and the fear mongering. So Applog has stepped up. You know, we for a long time, for 50 years, have been a second medical opinion in this issue of abortion. And we have stepped up and we have issued very clear guidance. So we have Um, A few documents on our website, one is called Concluding Pregnancy Ethically, and that's guidance for pro-life physicians. And basically what it says is all pregnancies have to end in some way, shape or form, right? The question is just whether how they end is ethical or isn't ethical. And so it gives a good framework for physicians to take any pregnancy scenario, because of course we can't possibly come up with every potential complication that any woman could ever face, you know? So it gives a good... um, 
framework for people to use, for physicians to use, to think through the clinical scenario that's in front of them and consider whether or not, you know, what they need to do uh, or what they're considering doing would be an ethical ending to that pregnancy. The other thing that we've done is put out a glossary of medical terms that really clarifies what is in an abortion, what are we talking about when we're talking about induced abortion. What we're talking about is intentional feticide, intentionally ending the life of that fetal human being. That's an induced abortion. That's never medically necessary. Sometimes we need to do maternal fetal separations where we separate mom and baby to save the life of the mother. Most times, thankfully, that's done after the baby can survive outside of mom. So there's no ethical dilemma there whatsoever. You deliver mom, you take care of mom, you take care of baby. It's something that I, in my role as a hospitalist, do every day that I'm at work. Um, Sometimes we have to do those separations pre-viability before baby can survive outside of mom. And those are heartbreaking situations. They're very difficult decisions to make. They're made in conjunction with the patient. But that can be done in a way that respects the life of that baby and leaves that baby intact so that mom and dad can hold that baby and grieve the loss of their child. So this, that's an interesting, I've never actually heard that term. So you're calling it mom-baby separation, where right. would others or call that like a therapeutic abortion? abortion? Right. Some people will use that term and, and, you know, some medical professionals will use that term. And I wouldn't say that that's wrong exactly. The only reason we, or one of the reasons we decided not to use that term and recommend using maternal fetal separation is because in the current cultural debate that we're having, we don't want anyone to confuse what we're talking about. That's true. That's what happens. Yeah. Because like, because I I had a conversation with a student when my last speaking tour stops we were talking about a life-threatening situation that happened to one of her family members uh, in like, she was like 25, 26 weeks. And I said, okay, what, can you explain to me how inducing cardiac arrest on the child, inserting Lumeria into her cervix, waiting two days and then delivering a dead baby, save that one, save, save her life. Like if, if she's, if she's, if she's going to die because she's gestating another human being, she can no longer gestate another human being. Wouldn't the, quickest way to save her life and the safest way would be to just deliver the human being. Why are we going in intentionally dismembering or causing a cardiac arrest? So, I mean, is is that what you're talking about, maternal fetal separation, where it's, we're not going to like dismember the baby in the process. We'll deliver the baby. Our medical technology isn't capable to sustain that child's life yet. Um, But we're not going to actively go in and tear the child piece by piece in a DNA abortion. Exactly. And Chris, I think you mentioned a couple really important things in that story that you just told. One was you said she was maybe 25, 26 weeks. In most hospitals in the U.S. right now, that baby can survive outside of mom. So first of all, there's no reason why you would have to intentionally end that baby's life while baby's still in utero. Second of all, what you described, the process of an abortion, an induced abortion, where you intentionally end baby's life at that stage of pregnancy actually takes a long time, even if they're going to do, um, you know, a DNA abortion, a dismemberment abortion on a 25, 26 week old baby, they still have to do some prep to the cervix in order to be able to open the cervix to get in there to do that. That takes time. I can tell you having done many, many stat C-sections for a life-threatening condition of mom at 25, 26 weeks, I can have that surgery done 30 minutes tops from start to finish, have baby out, save mom's life. That is so much faster. And it's respecting both of their lives. It's taking care of mom in an efficient manner where I'm getting things taken care of quickly, not letting her sit and linger for two days. Um, But also I'm respecting that baby's life and delivering that baby in a way that maximizes his or her chances of survival. And this really and truly is the way that most OBs practice. You know, it's interesting that now this equivocation is being made between ectopic pregnancy, miscarriage management, um, situations like we were just talking about maternal fetal separations to save mom's life. It's interesting that now those are being equivocated with abortion because that study, that survey that I quoted to you at the beginning that says that 93% of practicing OBGYNs do not perform abortions, that survey was done pre-Dobbs when people were being honest. If if physicians, if OBs thought that treating an ectopic pregnancy, doing an early delivery to save the life of the mother, treating a miscarriage were abortions, 
then when they were asked, do you do abortions? A hundred percent of them would have said yes, but they said no, yeah. because they understand what induced abortion is. And most OBs yeah. don't do yeah. it. And yet most of us, if not all of us who are doing obstetrics anyways, are, are treating all of those conditions and treating them well and doing a good job taking care of our patients. Yeah. No, I think that's so, it's so infuriating to see this gaslighting that's been happening, especially on social media of like, nope, you, nope, Dr. Francis does abortions because she treats ectopic pregnancies, you know, and it's, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I want to go through some stories in my head that I've just heard in the past couple months. So, and tell me if they're true, false, what the heck's going on. So there was a story, I think it was in Texas recently, and the Washington Post commented on it. Um, where a woman was becoming septic and they told her to go out to the parking lot and to wait until she had like a fever because they couldn't abort the child because the child was still alive inside of her. Is that good OB care to tell a patient you might become septic, but we can't, we can't, uh, we can't commit um, a separation procedure because a child's still alive. Like what would you do in that situation? Yeah. Well, first of all, my advice to that particular patient, if in fact that did happen, would be to sue that physician for medical malpractice, because no, that's not good OB care. This is not what we do. So as you know, as an OB who's and again, I can't speak to specifics of that because I don't know if it happened, you know what? But if she truly was showing signs of sepsis. I never know these stories are ever real either. These are just the stories that get related to me all the time. But Stories like that or some version of that story are being told over and over again. And there's that lawsuit in Texas right now by several women um, that actually many of them, if you look at at least what's detailed in their filing in the court case, they were not managed appropriately. And so, you know, again, as a physician who's pro-life, I've been in practice for 15 years. I have never performed an induced abortion. And yet I have never had a patient, a maternal patient, die from a preventable cause like sepsis in those situations because I do a good job taking care of them. So I personally, mm-hmm. with, with pre-viable rupture of membranes, which is a condition that keeps coming up, you know, in, in discussions when so mom's that's when water, your water breaks, breaks, right? Yeah, exactly. So mom's water breaks before the point of viability. And that can happen at any time during pregnancy. And, and the prognosis for baby differs depending on how far along mom is when her water breaks. Um, But in that situation, there is a risk that mom could develop sepsis. Even ACOG says that the risk is about 1% to 5%. So we're not talking about 50% of patients. It's a small number, but it's it's still a risk. So I personally will not induce labor if the baby is still alive and if mom is stable and shows no signs of infection. I have a conversation with the patient about, you know, again, prognosis, options, things like that. But... The right treatment in that case, if you're not immediately inducing labor, is not to send the patient home and say, see ya, come back when you're septic. That's not that's not how we treat women. Um, We keep them in the hospital for at least several days, if not longer, because their highest risk time of going into labor or developing an infection is within about that first week after her water breaks. And so I keep women in the hospital. I watch them like a hawk. And if they start to show even a single sign of infection, then I, again, as a very pro-life physician, I go in and I sit down and I have the hard conversation with them. And I say, you know, we were really going to try to do everything we could to save this baby, but now you're starting to show signs of infection. It is too dangerous for you. You guys could both die now at this point. Now you're starting to show signs of an infection. We need to get your labor induced before it develops into sepsis. And go ahead and get you delivered. But again, we do that in a way that respects the dignity of that child. And I will tell you, Kristen, I have never, ever had a patient. I'm not saying it would be impossible, but in 15 years of practice, I have never had a patient in that scenario develop sepsis and have to go to the ICU or die. Ever. Wow. So it is possible to give these women excellent care, intervene when you need to intervene but not do induced abortions. And so this this line that women are gonna die in droves, and there was a study that came out of Texas actually a few months after their their, um, SB8 bill passed that was out of a huge center that does a ton of obstetrics that they looked at patients that had this condition where their water broke pre-viability 
<clears throat> I can't remember the exact percentage, but they said something like 20 or 25% of their patients went to the ICU. To me, that's a huge red flag. That is not due to their state's law. That's due to mismanagement of those patients. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I do wonder if there aren't swaths of OBGYNs who, because they've always gone in situations like this to immediate induction of labor and not really expectantly manage these patients. And now maybe they're having, you know, or they feel like they have to expectantly manage more patients mm -hmm. and maybe they just don't actually know the right way to do that. I mean, I'm yeah. not knocking yeah. them in any way. We're all products of our training. And if they didn't train in a program like I did, you know, I uh, trained in a Catholic hospital. So we did expectantly manage these patients if they didn't have signs of infection and the baby was still alive. So we learned really well how to watch them closely, how to detect signs of infection early on before it became sepsis. This is how we take good care of women. And it can be done in states, even with the strongest pro-life protections, women can still receive excellent health care and have interventions done well before they develop sepsis. I think that's a really interesting point that you brought up, that you trained in a hospital where inducing an abortion was not the first option. Um, and not, like, it, I think that that's, that's really interesting because you think about that study out of Texas and, I mean, that's a really high number. Um, that's medical malpractice. I mean, that's one of the reasons we started PregnancyEmergency.org uh, at Students for Life because this is something I've become increasingly concerned about is I feel like if I were to get pregnant again and I would have, you know, a high-risk pregnancy or a complication arise, I would be okay because I know about Applog. And I know I can go to applog.org, type in my zip code, and I can find a pro-life OBGYN who's going to treat me and my child. But most women do not know. And so they're going, they're presenting symptoms at the ER and you don't know. I mean, I think that's what's scary for women in America is you don't know if that OBGYN you're seeing is really an abortion activist. Right. And it's just going to say, well, this is all I can do. Because I almost have gotten this feeling. I don't know. Tell me, you're much more charitable towards people uh, <laughs> in, in your field than probably that I am. But I've almost gotten this feeling that, and maybe this is because I, I do all these media interviews with, you know, NPR, Washington Post, New York Times. But it's like, they're actively looking for a woman to die. Because like what happened in Ireland with, um, and I'm going to mispronounce her name, so please don't put it in the comments. Uh, you all know I can't pronounce anything. It's Savita Halpapnar. Hal she was the woman in, she was a dentist in Galway. She became septic. The gestational sac was actually protruding from her body. The water broke. The fetus the child still had a heartbeat. The hospital wouldn't, wouldn't separate child from mother, and she ended up dying from an infection. And they used Savita's case to legalize abortion throughout all of Ireland. Right. And so I feel like that's what the abortion lobby is doing right now in America. Like They're like every day getting on Google going, did a pregnant woman die in a red state? If so, why did she die? Is this a story we can sensationalize and make our case why abortion, every abortion, even, you know, 97 percent of abortions are abortions of convenience should be legal in our country? Do you have do you feel that way, too? Or is it just me? Am I just like super negative? Well, you know, I, I definitely think that the abortion lobby and uh, abortion advocates are using women who are suffering you know horrendous pregnancy complications to to justify their radical abortion agenda, which is, you know, abortion through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason and with no restrictions. Um, I, you know, whether or not there are some physicians who are advocating for that, there very well could be. Um, I will tell you, though, that in talking to a lot of physicians, um, there are a lot of physicians who are just confused um, because you know, I think they've practiced their whole careers under row and maybe falsely, assumed that the reason that they could do these interventions, uh, you know, when mom's life was in danger was because Roe was the law of the land. Um, most physicians are busy taking care of their patients and they don't spend a lot of time reading, you know, the language of the bill in their state. That's a very, it's almost like a foreign language. And so if you're not used to reading it, it can be confusing. Um, but it is time for physicians to educate themselves about the, uh, the law of their state and what that law allows for. But I tell you who I'm really calling out in all of this are 
hospital lawyers, hospital systems, and state medical boards, as well as national organizations like ACOG. They are the ones who should be providing guidance to physicians so that physicians don't have any fear of repercussions if they intervene immediately, like we always would in cases where women's lives are in danger. So, you know, are there some physicians out there who are abortion activists? Yes. All you have to do is look at Physicians for Reproductive Health, PRH. They're all they're all physician uh, abortion activists. But I think most, the vast majority of practicing OBs who maybe are are delaying care or or a little unsure, it's mostly because they're confused and they need better guidance. And again, that's where Applog has really yeah. tried to step into that gap that's been left by ACOG. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just seems like ACOG just just abdicated any responsibility here when you guys are, you know, at Applog stepping up. Um, right. Can we go through like another, so I, I just want to go through some other ones that we commonly hear as pro-life advocates. What about a situation of preeclampsia mm -hmm. where, you know, what we're told over and over again that you have to commit abortion if, if she's becoming preeclamptic. If you don't, she's going to die. Right, right. Well, so preeclampsia is definitely a life-threatening condition of pregnancy. I don't know any uh, competent physician who would disagree with that. The, the good news, if you could call it that, I suppose, about preeclampsia is that in nearly every case, not every case, but in nearly every case, preeclampsia develops after the point of viability, typically in the third trimester. So that'd be 28 weeks or beyond. Um, certainly 24 weeks or beyond is when we see, I would say, probably at least 98% of cases of preeclampsia, if not more. So again, in that situation, if she has preeclampsia with severe, what we call severe features, then you typically will just go ahead and deliver her. Now, even that being said, even if you look at ACOG's guidance, if they have preeclampsia with severe features, but they're stable, you actually can keep them pregnant as long as they remain stable until 34 weeks and then you deliver at 34 weeks. Mm -hmm. If they have preeclampsia without severe features then and stay stable, then you deliver them at 37 weeks. So all of these are points in pregnancy where baby can survive. And the reason for that guidance is because you're balancing risk. You're balancing risk to baby and you're balancing risk to mom. And at whatever point the risk to mom outweighs the risk to baby, then you deliver. Um, if, and I have seen, I think one, maybe two cases in my entire career where a woman developed severe preeclampsia prior to viability, there was no way that we could temporize things. She was rapidly getting sicker. Then you deliver her immediately. And, um, and that is the cure for preeclampsia. And so the claim that we need induced abortion or abortion in the third trimester, I've heard that one too because of preeclampsia is ridiculous. Um, you know, and again, most times, not that whether or not a pregnancy is wanted or desired makes a difference as to whether or not abortion is okay or not. But, but you know, even most abortion advocates would agree that you shouldn't do an abortion in a desired pregnancy. In most cases with preeclampsia, these are desired pregnancies. So really their argument based on preeclampsia falls apart at so many different levels. That's awesome. Well, I mean, that's so, so very helpful um, for our conversations that we're having with abortion advocates. Um, so I thank you. Thank you for going, kind of going through that, even though, you know, I'm giving you like just general and nothing specific. Um, I, one last kind of thing I want to talk to you about and get your feedback on is you're working. So Applog has officially sued the FDA because you all for years have been trying to get the FDA to... Um, I believe, you know, institute common sense safety standards on chemical abortion pills, REMS, risk evaluation med mitigation strategies. Uh, they failed to do that, respond to you. I believe you all have sued them with the help of ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, can you tell me what the importance of this case is and where it currently stands? I know all of us have probably heard about this Texas drug judge, you know, who single-handedly, you know, right before Easter, uh, stopped chemical abortion. And then there was like another, there was another circuit decision. Can you explain what's going on in that case? Because we really haven't heard much about it. Yeah, well, and I can give you a brief overview because I don't have my lawyer here with me. But, um, but yeah, so that I could give uh, your listeners a place that they could go to get all the latest up-to-date information. But, um, 
Yeah, so Applog is one of several plaintiffs. We're one of four um, professional medical organizations, along with four individual plaintiffs, who sued the FDA over their illegal approval of the dangerous chemical abortion drug mifepristone. And as you said, Kristen, we've been um, trying to get the FDA to listen to us since just a couple of years after the approval, actually, we filed our first citizen's petition in 2002, uh, which is the process that you're supposed to go through with the FDA if you have concerns about a medication that they have approved. And so we filed that. And rather than respond within the six months that they're supposed to respond, it took them 14 years to respond to our citizen's petition. So they stonewalled us and then removed even the minimal safeguards that they had into place and have continued to do so to the point where now women and girls can receive these dangerous drugs through the mail after getting online and ordering them really without any interaction at all with a medical professional, no screening for things like ectopic pregnancy. So it's interesting that abortion advocates yell and yell and yell that women aren't going to be able to be treated for ectopic pregnancy because of pro-life laws. And yet they don't care about screening women for ectopic pregnancy and they just give them pills through the mail. Um, so of course they're talking out of both sides of their mouths, but they're not being screened for gestational age, which we know the farther along in pregnancy a woman is when she takes these drugs, the higher the risk of complications. Um, many other things, not being screened for intimate partner violence, for trafficking, not being adequately counseled about the risks of these drugs, which are significant. We know that they have a four times higher complication rate than surgical abortions. And that emergent in one study that looked at from 2002 to 2015, emergency room visits related to chemical abortion drugs increased by over 500%. So we know that women are routinely ending up in emergency rooms. I've seen it in my own emergency room mm -hmm. um, from complications related to these drugs. And so it was because of the FDA's continued stonewalling of our efforts to um, get them to take a better look at the evidence about the dangers of these drugs and reinstitute, at the very least, reinstitute basic safety protections. But we're also calling for uh, the revoking of the approval because it was done in really an illegal manner. They ignored their own rules and regulations when they approved this drug. And so that's why we filed the lawsuit. Um, it's been to multiple different courts at this point, and we're currently waiting mm -hmm. on uh, yeah. a decision from the Fifth Circuit. Uh, in relation to the preliminary injunction. So it's kind of complicated. In fact, it's been a learning process for me about how That's the legal process you. works. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but people can go to the Alliance Defending Freedom website and just search for um, FDA on the website and they'll be able to find our case. Right. And ADF has a very good timeline on their website of sort of where the case has been and where we're at right now. So we're hoping for a decision soon from the Fifth Circuit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so important because you all are physicians who are seeing these women present, mm -hmm. you know, serious complications in emergency rooms um, because the abortion lobby, you know, has advanced this drug that we know harms women mm -hmm. and it has a tremendously high incompletion rate, um, a higher complication rate than surgical abortions. Uh, and then when we talk about it, it's it's like being it's all swept under the rug like it's nothing. But, you know, what, what did they try to they literally tried to argue in the one brief in Texas that it was safer than ibuprofen when literally ibuprofen doesn't have a black box warning. But when the FDA approved yeah. chemical abortion drugs, they literally put a black box warning. Right. Exactly. Well, and to me, the just clearest indicator of how little uh, our FDA apparently cares about women and girls came during the oral arguments uh, at the Fifth Circuit. Towards the end of oral arguments, one of the judges very astutely asked the uh, the lawyer for the DOJ and the FDA um, how women were supposed to be screened for ectopic pregnancies if they're just obtaining these pills online. And she said, well, they asked them questions. And he said, like, what kind of questions? And she said, they ask if they they can ask if they have shoulder pain. And I gasped out loud. Everybody sitting around me turned and looked at me because I think they didn't understand why I gasped. But let me tell your audience why I gasped. If a woman with an ectopic pregnancy is having shoulder pain, that means that she has an abdomen full of blood that has gone up to the level of her diaphragm, irritate which your diaphragm sits right underneath of your lungs. So that's high up. Your uterus and your tubes are way down in your pelvis. Your diaphragm is high up in your abdomen. So she's got enough blood in her belly that it has filled her abdomen to the point where it's 
touching her diaphragm. Blood is very irritating to the diaphragm. And there's a nerve, the phrenic nerve, that runs from your diaphragm into your right shoulder. And so if the diaphragm gets irritated, it causes what we call referred pain into the right shoulder. So if a woman has shoulder pain from an ectopic pregnancy, she is going to die very soon if she is not operated on immediately. So if she has shoulder pain, she should be on an operating table within 15 to 20 minutes. And so if that's how the FDA thinks that women should be screened for ectopic pregnancy before they are given these drugs, I think it shows very clearly how little regard they have for the health of women and girls who are obtaining these pills. That's unbelievable. That's the the government's actually arguing that? That that was their response when they were asked, how should women be screened for ectopic pregnancies if they're getting these pills online? It's a total disregard for the lives of mothers across America is what it is. And their quest for unlimited taxpayer abortion all nine months that they're willing to sacrifice women's lives at the altar of, of abortion. It's unbelievable. I'm so thankful for what you do and what all of Applaw does. You guys are this invaluable asset to the pro-life movement, but then also to every single woman of reproductive age in America. How, do, how does one, I guess, how does a med student get involved with Applaw? How, how does any woman who wants to make sure she's being seen by a doctor who is, doesn't have blood on his or her hands that will see her and her child, both as patients, how does somebody like me get, you know, find an Applaw doctor? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to answer your second question first. So for any woman out there uh, who is looking for pro-life OB, you can go to our website, as Kristen said, applog.org, and um, click on the physician directory. And you can search by your state to see uh, which of our members might be in your state. Now, I will I will say that with a word of caution and that our physicians have to opt in to being listed. And um, and so if they practice in a very contentious environment where they face very real um, threats to their career, if they are publicly pro-life, they may not be listed. So um, I we get calls sometimes from patients that are frustrated in uh, typically very blue, very pro-abortion states saying, are there no members in my state? Chances are there probably are, but they just are are concerned about being listed publicly. And it's certainly understandable. But at the very least, you can start there. You can We can't give out our member information, but if you can't find somebody, reach out to us. There may be something that we can do for you. Um, so that's how you find a pro-life physician. And I would also just say too, to anyone who's not a medical professional who's listening to this, if you go to a physician who you know is pro-life, please encourage them. It is such a hard time to be pro-life in medicine right now. And I think physicians need to hear that this is what patients want and that patients are happy to be able to see a pro-life physician. So please just the next time you see your doctor, encourage them, thank them for being pro-life, thank them for what they're doing to defend moms and their babies. Um, this, the, to answer your first question for um, any students, medical students, residents, pre-med students that are listening to this, students can join Applog for free and get all the dues paying um, benefits uh, without having to pay dues while you're a student. So um, so just go to the website. There's a little button that you can click on join. Also, our registration for our national conference, which will be next February in Dallas, just opened yesterday. And we have a scholarship for students where we pay all of your expenses. We cover your travel, your um, conference costs, your hotel, so that you can come, if you're a medical student or a resident, you can come and be a part of our conference to hear excellent evidence-based information, but also to network with other pro-life students and pro-life practicing physicians. I think it's really a time of encouragement for students. So and that's we'd love super to have important you too. That's super important that you develop those networks and those relationships with practicing doctors while you're in mid school. So thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for all you do and all your leadership uh, on this uh, this important um, issue and, and, you know, really being there and standing in the gap uh, and doing what ACOG and so many others won't do. You guys are truly the, the on the ground lifesavers. And so it's an honor to be allied with Applog. And thank you all uh, for tuning into this episode of Explicitly Pro-Life. There was a lot of amazing information. I was taking notes. I hope you were taking notes. Uh, make sure you share this article I mean, sorry, this episode with friends, uh, family, people on the fence, people who might have questions about what to do in certain pregnancy situations um, and keep the conversation going. Bye, everyone. Mm-hmm.